This is my old phone. It's an iPhone SE second generation that I got towards the end of 2020. I got it to replace this, an iPhone 7 that I got as a hand-me-down from my dad in 2019. And while I would have loved to use the iPhone 7 for more than a year, there was one issue that made the phone so unusable that I had to upgrade. The battery. See, when my dad first got the iPhone 7, it could last about 8 hours before trading to 0%. But in 2019, just about 3 years later, the phone only had a fraction of its maximum battery charge left, dying after only 2 or so hours of use. So, let's say this happens to you. You've had your smartphone for around 3 years and its battery health is in the gutter. And because of how your phone was designed, you're unable to fix it yourself with the tools you already own. So what are your options? Well, you could try to fix it yourself with some non-Apple certified tools and a YouTube tutorial, but then you could risk completely breaking your phone. Or you could give it to Apple or a third-party repair store to get them to fix your battery, of course with a fee. But then again, you've had this phone for a while, and there's a new phone that just came out that you've really wanted, and since your old phone is already going out, you might as well just upgrade to the new one, right? Well, that third option is the route a lot of people take, and their old degraded phone just ends up, eventually, sitting in a landfill. The same thing happens to many other electronic devices, laptops, computer components, tablets, even things like kitchen appliances and vehicles. All of this is what we call e-waste, and it's extremely harmful to our environment and everything that lives in it, including us humans. But what really is e-waste, and what makes it so bad? E-waste, by definition, classifies discarded electrical or electronic devices. As I mentioned, there are various different types of e-waste, though the majority of it, by weight, is small equipment. Phones, microwaves, kettles, and more. Today, we'll mainly be focusing on phones, laptops, and computers. You see, unlike most trash, e-waste contains various different metals, many of which are toxic to humans and other animals. A few notable toxins found in e-waste are lead, mercury, nickel, and lithium. As we all know, lead is quite toxic. However, you might be surprised that most electronics contain lead. You know those old tube TVs? Those contain about 4-5 to five pounds of lead each. Even your phone and other smaller devices contain trace amounts of lead in the soldering metal they use. E-waste generates some 58,000 tons of lead each year, all of which seeps into the soil and finds its way into our water supplies and the flora and fauna that we eventually consume. Here's a brief overview of how lead affects the human body. Lead has a similar chemical structure to calcium, making it absorb easily into the bones where it can stay for 25-30 to 30 years. Once this lead enters your body, it can affect your nervous system, your kidneys, your immune system, your reproductive system, and your cardiovascular system, among others. Even more alarmingly, because this lead poisoning is in our environment, everyone is exposed to it. Young children have it the worst. Since they're known to be quite sensitive to lead exposure, and many have developed behavioral problems, learning deficits, and lowered IQ, all from the lead pollution they've been exposed to in the environment. This also affects unborn children. Lead can cross the placental barrier of a pregnant woman, meaning that if a pregnant woman is exposed to lead, so is their unborn child. A large portion of this lead comes from e-waste. Batteries are also a huge issue when it comes to e-waste. Every mobile phone, tablet, and laptop has a battery inside of it. These are usually lithium-ion batteries that are often heavily degraded by the time they hit the landfill. Over time, these batteries will corrode and even further degrade, causing the chemicals and toxic metals inside of them to seep into the soil and contaminate surface water and groundwater. All of these toxins end up in our tap water, and even inside the animals and plants we eat that were exposed to these toxins. On top of this, these lithium batteries can be very unstable and can burst into flames, causing landfill fires that can burn for years on end. These fires release toxic gases and chemicals into the air that both affect our lungs and contribute to global warming. So, e-waste is really bad for the environment. It's incredibly toxic, and since we're also a part of the environment, all of these toxins eventually cycle back to us and hurt all of humanity. But what can we do to help reduce the amount of e-waste in landfills? Well, there's a pretty clear-cut solution to this, right to repair laws. So, what are right to repair laws? Well, the name is pretty self-explanatory. Right to repair laws are a proposed set of laws that would require tech manufacturers to make their tech easily and practically repairable by equipment owners. In simple terms, they would force companies like Apple to make iPhones easily repairable by the end user, or at least force them to provide repair tools at an affordable price. Let's go back to my iPhone story from the beginning of the video. If Apple had just made the iPhone 7 more user-friendly to repair, I would have easily chosen to replace its battery myself. After all, I'm no stranger to tech repair. I've been repairing old video game consoles and building and modifying computers for a number of years now. If right to repair laws were put into place, the iPhone 7 would have been easy for me to open up and repair. Right to repair laws in this case would have created the ideal scenario. I would have saved a lot of money since I wouldn't have had to buy a brand new phone for hundreds of dollars, and in turn, the old iPhone 7 would have been kept out of the landfill. 
Unfortunately, because right-to-repair laws haven't been passed nationwide, the iPhone 7 was designed to be nearly impossible to repair by the average user. The phone is designed to only be opened by Apple or Apple-certified service providers. iPhones use these specialized screws in place of traditional Phillips heads or flat heads. They're also glued shut and require a special heating device and prying tool to get them open. So why haven't right-to-repair laws been established yet? They seem to be such an obvious solution to both e-waste and saving money. Well, there's a really sad reason for this. Though the environment and consumers benefit from these laws being passed, tech companies end up taking a big financial hit. These companies want you to buy a new device every year so that they can maximize profit. To them, your old device breaking is a good thing, since it means that you'll likely just end up buying a new one and forking over some cash. Even more alarmingly, a lot of these companies that actively stand against right to repair laws are ones that you've definitely heard of. Tesla, Johnson & Johnson, AT&T, T-Mobile, John Deere, General Electric, Philips, eBay, the list goes on and on. Of course, the big five tech companies are also actively against right to repair laws. Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. All of these companies that lobby against right to repair laws being passed are cumulatively worth about $10.7 trillion. All of these companies use certain tricks to attack their consumers' right to open up and repair their electronics. Of course, there's the classic method of using specialized proprietary screws that the average consumer wouldn't be able to unscrew. There's also the practice of making screws so small and fragile that over-tightening them by just a hair would completely break your device. Laptop manufacturers have also been making their devices less modular over time, meaning that they are becoming less and less user-upgradable. This practice involves companies soldering down components like storage and system memory to prevent users from self-upgrading. Of course, their goal is for consumers looking for an upgrade to just buy a brand new model. An even shadier thing these companies use is the warranty sticker. I'm sure you've seen those stickers that are found pretty commonly on laptops and video game consoles. The ones that read, warranty void if removed, or something along those lines. Legally, these stickers are illegal. Companies aren't allowed to use them to void customers' warranties on their products. The issue here is that it often takes a lot more money for the average consumer to sue for a voided warranty than it would to just buy a new device. And because of this, these companies have gotten away with their warranty stickers. Culprits of using the warranty sticker include Crucial, Samsung, PNY, ASUS, MSI, AMD, Kingston, Acer, Sony, Microsoft, and NVIDIA, just to name a few. However, by far the most vile move companies make against right to repair is something called planned hardware obsolescence. This is the practice of designing a product intended to break after a certain amount of time in use. Intentionally designing these faulty products means that consumers are inevitably forced to buy replacements, since these products are also often made intentionally difficult for consumers to open and repair. Though no companies would ever admit to such a practice, most electronics that last under two years are most likely built this poorly on purpose. Even if a company sells replacement parts for these products, it's a telltale sign of planned hardware obsolescence if the cost of buying these parts is almost the same as just getting a new device. Sadly, it's near impossible to boycott all of these companies in today's technology-filled world. So how can we get these companies to stop these practices without going cold turkey on the internet? Well, once again, right-to-repair legislation is the solution. Getting right-to-repair laws passed would force all of these companies to abandon their greedy, anti-consumer practices and make their devices easily and affordably repairable by every end-user. And here's some good news. Right-to-repair laws are already being passed, or at least are being heavily considered, in a few parts of the world. The EU has already passed right-to-repair laws, and over half of the US states are considering right-to-repair laws. The state of Massachusetts has passed some right-to-repair-esque laws, though they're quite limiting, and just recently New York's governor signed a modified right-to-repair law. And even though these laws aren't as restrictive on the tech giants as we hoped they would be, they're most certainly a step in the right direction of the future of right-to-repair. So what can we do to promote right-to-repair laws and reduce the amount of e-waste in the environment? It's important to note that though we can never get rid of e-waste, it's important to minimize it as much as possible, both with right-to-repair laws and with our own behavior. Here are a few ideas. We can recycle old electronics and batteries so that their parts can be used for new tech. If you'd like to try your hand in self-repair and don't have much to lose, you can always find guides or third-party tools to repair or even upgrade your old electronics. Though many new electronics are difficult and sometimes even impossible to open up and repair or upgrade, older electronics often aren't as difficult to work with. If you're not that comfortable with opening up your tech, you can always support a local repair shop to have them repair or upgrade it for you. Just be sure you read reviews and aren't paying too much. Even if you have an old device lying around, like an old phone, tablet, or computer that you aren't using anymore, you can always donate it to a family member or friend who could use it, rather than storing it in a drawer somewhere and forgetting about it. That way, your old device can be given more use. And of course, spread the word about right to repair. Find lawmakers that are open to the idea of right to repair laws being passed and vote them in. 
And in the meantime, speak louder against companies who use anti-consumer repair practices to pressure them to change. They might just have a change of heart. Remember, every effort you make to prolong the life of a device keeps one more piece of e-waste out of the landfill. And when a device really does reach the end of its life, be sure to recycle it. Right to repair is extremely important, and advocating for it will lead to a cleaner world while also saving you a ton of money. And as always, thanks for watching.